Peru, under Alan Garcia, 1985, made an, an offer which was actually more clever than what the Icelanders are talking about. <clears throat> that was 10% of the foreign exchange earnings, 10% of the actual dollars that you got from exports might be available for the international bankers and the IMF. That sounds plausible, but it turned out to be a fatal mistake, a terrible, tragic mistake by Alan Garcia. He needed to declare a debt moratorium. Instead, he tried to pay. The bankers treated him as a communist and a terrorist. He got all the disadvantages of a debt moratorium without any of the tremendous advantages that he could have had. Peru slipped into hyperinflation. Peru then slipped into dictatorship under Fukimori. This is a bad result. So the big hope here in Iceland is that the British and the Dutch will reject the 6% of future GDP offer, and therefore they will uh, essentially uh, get the Icelanders out of this bind that they're now in, because if the British and the Dutch reject a reasonable offer, then a lot of people in Iceland are going to say, we've had it, we're fed up. There are important forces in the parliament that want to get the IMF out of the Icelandic picture, and there are others who are now, I think, quite interested in the concept of a debt moratorium. Remember, uh, under globalization, over the past couple of decades, we've had 30 to 40 countries that have declared debt moratorium. Let's just remind ourselves of this list. We'll go through it. Countries that have declared debt moratorium between 1980 and 2004. Albania, quite small, quite poor. Algeria, Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Bulgaria, Chile, Costa Rica, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, Jordan, Mexico, Moldova, Morocco, Nigeria, Pakistan, Panama, Peru, the Philippines, Poland, Romania, Russian Federation, South Africa, Turkey, Ukraine, Uruguay, Venezuela. That's quite a list. That's a cross-section of the world. Countries big, small, left-wing, right-wing, Latin American, Eastern European, South Asian, Catholic, Muslim, uh, nothing at all, uh, big, little, with oil, without oil, with minerals, without minerals. It's a general tendency of all nations under this bankrupt, globalized, hot money system that sooner or later a debt moratorium is essential. The big examples, of course, are Mexico in 1982 with Lopez Portillo. With that Mexican debt moratorium 1982, we could have gone towards a debtor's cartel, an organization of the debtor countries to counter the extortion and blackmail of the well-organized creditors with some kind of organized resistance. The creditors are organized in the IMF, the World Bank, the Bank for International Settlements, the London Club, the Paris Club. Why shouldn't the debtors, why shouldn't the poor countries, the countries that are on the receiving end of all this, have their own united front? Maybe if Iceland goes for a debt moratorium, then they'll be joined by other countries as well. Iceland could precipitate a whole series of other countries around the world, poorer countries. For example, the countries that are active in UNCTAD. We have a call recently from the Secretary General of UNCTAD, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, calling for a debt moratorium for the poorest and most indebted countries. Well, Iceland has re recently been considered the most developed country in the world from certain standpoints, but thanks to Gordon Brown and Balkanenda, they now risk going into the category of the most indebted and indeed poor countries. So there's no shame in a debt moratorium. There's no opprobrium. My God, everybody does it. Nuclear powers like Russia, proud ancient countries, uh, Mexico, countries that have come out of nowhere in recent years like Moldova. And in particular, Iceland is a, is a small island, but uh, 300,000 people. Is Iceland so different from Costa Rica or from Panama? Costa Rica, very small, no military forces. Similarly here, Iceland, no real standing army. There is a navy. Uh, there's also a tradition of fighting. Uh, the Cod Wars, when the British in the 1970s tried to monopolize the fisheries here in the North Atlantic, people may remember 
these British cruisers, uh, fairly heavy warships, uh, colliding with small Icelandic patrol vessels. Uh, uh, very unequal, but uh, the Icelanders were able to stand off the British and prevent them from dictating the new division of the North Atlantic uh, fisheries. So um, it's been about one debt moratorium per year over the last couple of decades. Uh, Iceland could be the beginning of a new wave, a debt moratorium leading to the assertion of national sovereignty and national independence. We'll be right back with Thoralyn Einarsson, who's going to give us a report from the Icelandic point of view. America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Once again, this week we're in Reykjavik, Iceland, the epicenter, ground zero, the fighting front in the war of national independence, dignity, and economic development against supranational, oligarchical, elitist institutions attempting to impose the yoke of usury and debt upon the world. Now, let's, let's hear from the Icelandic side. I'm joined here in Reykjavik by Thorarin Einarsson, who is one of the leading activists. He was part of this magnificent mass strike process, which uh, occurred here in Reykjavik in the form of meetings and demonstrations, especially during the months of December, uh, November, December, and January of 08 into 09. Uh, we were just at the uh, parliament yesterday, the Althing, the, in some accounts, the oldest parliament in the world, opened, and we had the biggest demonstration ever for the opening of the Althing. But let, let's let uh, Thoran tell the story in his own way, as seen from Iceland, and, and fill you in about what you need to know. Yes, hello. Um, my name is Thorin Einarsson, and I want to preview about the situation in Iceland. Uh, it's been uh, exactly one year now this week when uh, this crisis here in Iceland started, and was mainly we had three very huge banks, and they um, a few years ago they had been privatized and they uh, overgrew about uh, the size of, um, well, ten times the uh, GDP. And uh, they were mainly financed on uh, short-term loans. They were very relied on uh, getting these kind of loans. And they just uh, they borrowed like there was uh, no tomorrow. And it was very risky business. And, uh, of course, they thought they would just always get these loans and they could expand it forever. Very... Uh, irresponsible. But then uh, uh, they started to get uh, some no's. Uh, uh, they didn't, uh, it was difficult to get these loans, started to be, uh, get difficult, and so they get the brilliant idea to open deposit accounts in Europe. So they start to use the, the money of the common people in Europe. Uh, Europe. And of course they promised uh, very high interest and at that time, uh, the interest rate was growing uh, very fast in Iceland. It was uh, uh, because of uh, it was so inflationary our uh, economy and the central bank. They had uh, a silly policy who thought they could uh, control the uh, inflation and just uh, raising the interest rate. And, but the, the banks actually used that to uh, to uh, fool the uh, Europeans to. Um, Know, for high interest uh, deposit accounts, and so uh, they sucked in a lot of money from the Europeans. And actually, still we still don't know what, uh, today what really happened to this money. It was just kind of stolen from the, uh, the European people. But uh, so one year ago, um, it was evident that the um, banks were having problems. They could not, you know, pay some loan on debt and. Uh, it started to crumble. There was a lot of panic, and they were demanding loans. Of course, they had huge assets, but the really thing was that they didn't have the currency. They had a lot of krona, the Icelandic currency, but they didn't have really uh, foreign currency, you know, actual currency to pay uh, these loans. 
So they were desperate. They went to the central bank, and uh, uh, he, they, he was David Otson, and he uh, he, he was uh, also, yeah, giving both loans and also saying no, and he was desperate, didn't know what was the right choice. But and, and, uh, anyway, in the end, uh, in just few days, all of these three banks, they were nationalized. And um, uh, and uh, it was uh, sec uh, uh, security laws in Iceland uh, that uh, would ensure, uh, ensure the deposit accounts of all Icelanders or you know people in within Iceland, but not for other branches that were actually in Europe. So Icelanders basically kept their money uh, well system going. You know people having still their money while well, losing something, but uh, the people in uh, in Europe that has uh, especially what is called the ISAF in Landsbanki, they did not get their money. 